Okay, so uh, Professor John Weckett is uh, from Australia and one of the AUSM visiting professors and has kindly come to Bangkok. Thank you, John. He's also the editor of the journal Nanoethics, so he's the leading expert on nanoethics in the world. So, uh, thank yes, you, John. Darryl, look, I should put you right on, well, on two things. One, I'm not one of the leading experts, but the other thing is I've handed over the editorship of the Nanoethics Journal to Christopher Kernan in Germany. I'm still on the editorial board. But, um, you know, is this so, working? No. Yeah. No, it's not only uh, Push it up. Yeah, that, that sounds better. Okay. Um, start off by saying what the beginning is that there's not a lot of ethics as such in this talk. What I'm really doing is trying to set the ground or the groundwork for what we need to do when we look at the ethics of um, of nanotechnology. Well, actually, of all new technologies, uh, when we're talking about emerging technologies, but I'll get on to that in a minute. I want to say first a bit about nanotechnology. Some of you probably know a lot about it already. Some of you mightn't, but there are a few things that are worth saying because they're important for. Um, looking at the, the technology, sorry, the, the ethics. First, and probably the most important thing, is that nanotechnology is what's often called an enabling technology. Nanotechnology in itself doesn't actually do a lot, but what it does is enable a lot of other technologies. It enhances other technologies. Um, for example, in computer technology, computer technology is simply um, is different from nanotech, but computers wouldn't have quite the capacities they have now if it weren't for nanotechnology, particularly at this stage with respect to memory size. Um, well, we have these little memory sticks now which hold enormous volume. Some of you wouldn't realise how amazing it is probably because they've been around for as long as you've been using computers. But not very long ago, you had to have a fairly big thing to hold anywhere near that sort of capacity. I mean, it's not really all that long ago that I think it was um, Bill Gates who said something like, who would ever need more than, was it 256 or 512K or something? Now, I mean, you use that on one click of your computer, with, but and now the, um, with, Developments in that we've got enormous, um, enormously more capacity. Um, nanotechnology can be defined as engineering at a very small scale. It's at the nano scale, the um, well, the molecular and um, atomic level. Normally, it's reserved for talking about things that go on at less than. 100 nanometers, 100 nanometer, sorry, one nanometer is 12 to the minus 9, which is a billion to the meter, which is pretty small. The one comparison is that, well, a bucky ball is something like a nanoparticle, a bit smaller. Um, but if you take the comparison between the earth and the football, that's a soccer ball. Um, well, any football is more or less the same size, just a different shape. But the earth and the football, and then a football to a nanoparticle. It's the same sort of um, comparison. So they are pretty small. The human hair is roughly 75,000 nanometers. So when we're talking about things at the nanometer level, um, they're very little. Now, why is this important? It's important because materials have different properties at that size. Um, quantum effects come into play. Um, new products can be developed. Very small products or very small components can be developed. Um, back in the Middle Ages, um, they didn't know about nanomaterials as such, but 
people who made stained glass windows in Europe did actually use nano principles to get different colours in the uh, in the glass. So in a sense, it's been around for a long time. Uh, but anyway, new products can be developed, very small products or components can be developed, which is one reason now why, I mean, this, um, this is an iPhone and it's moderately big. Presumably they could be just a fraction of this size, but nobody could use them. Um, it's not that long ago that, um, what do you call them, mobile phones were almost the size of a brick. Um, and one reason we can um, make them smaller is because of the nano. That's not the only reason, but it's certainly one. Now, I don't know whether you can read this. This is um, just off a website that lists the nano products at the mo that are around on the market at the moment, or that contain uh, nano uh, materials or whatever. Health and fitness um, is the biggest. Uh, home and garden, automotive, food and beverage, electronics and computers, appliances, goods for children. I'll just say a bit more about various uh, ones of these. The health and fitness is the area, I guess, where there's been the most discussion in the literature with this, well, one of the areas, targeted drug delivery. Um, is a big one. One of the things that there's a lot of research on is, say, in, in cancer treatment, if you want to get rid of cancer cells, currently at the moment you just bombard the whole body with um, whatever drugs are necessary. Uh, with encapsulating or attaching, or well, what they're hoping is that you can attach the drug to um, variously constructed nanoparticles and then that drug will just attach itself to the, the cancer cell or the cancer cell so you don't need to um, have the effect on the whole body. Super muscles, which a lot of us would probably like. Um, this is research that's going on just to develop muscles particularly well at this stage for robots and so on, but also potentially for people who have got, um, well, who've had muscle damage or were born with um, muscle problems and so on. Um, appetite stimulation for people who um, um, have got anorexia or some other eating problem. I can give you references where this stuff can be found, but. Um, just at the moment, I'll just set out some of the things. Antibacterial coping for use in hospitals. Hospitals are notoriously bad for spreading germs. Um, you can have antibacterial coping using nanomaterials. Water filtration, sporting goods. Um, health, again, faster diagnosis. And there's a lot of talk about um, I've said before, uh, actually implanting um, certain devices under the skin so that diagnosis can happen pretty well automatically. If there's something wrong with you, um, it'll tell you. What will probably happen, of course, is that we'll be all, all become even worse um, hypochondriacs because we'll always think there's something wrong with us that's going to kill us shortly, which is probably so we don't actually want to know about it. Um, nanoparticles can target specific disease cells. I just mentioned that they can have drugs with better solubility and so on. Um, small enough to enter tumours. Drug carrying devices. Pharmacy on a chip for monitoring and regulating the body's hormonal balance. So you don't need necessarily go to the doctor for your blood tests. That can all happen automatically, although this is where the research lies at the moment. And um, I'll go over this all fairly quickly just to give you a background. Growth or construction of body parts, 
um, development of materials that the body wants to reject. One of the big problems in transplants is what the that the body tends to reject things that are foreign, um, but there's a lot of research going on uh, to find materials that the body won't reject. Development of cell repair devices. Um, those are just some of the things to do with, um, with health. Electronics and computing, development of computers that are very, very small, very, very fast, have enormous memories. Development of very sensitive input devices to computers so that um, it's possible to hear sound, see things, detect any sort of movement and so on in, um, at a much greater sensitivity than, than we can now. Ultra low power semiconductors to be used in the internet of things which certainly if everything has some um, sort of device attached to it so that everything is related um, there's a problem with power if we can have ultra low power semiconductors that gets over that. Whether we need an internet of things is another matter which I won't get into today. Um, food and beverages, nano texturing, that's so you can change the texture of a food so that it tastes better or feels better or something, so you don't, you don't have to wrap fat or something else to um, make it nicer like um, all these low fat foods. Usually, you had so many other horrible things that they were less for you than high fat foods. But nano texturing, presumably, you could. So the nano encapsulation, um, sort of encapsulating various things for food um, in the um, nano smart smart food packaging, where the package itself can tell you when the food's going off, can protect the food for longer, and so on. Now, as I was saying, most of these are still research areas. Um, and in Australia, one of the biggest research areas in, is in materials science. I said before that um, nanotech is an enabling science. Um, and in one of the things that enables is new materials. And here are just some improved food packaging, intelligent packaging that is um, yeah, packaging that can actually tell you what's going on inside the package. Sunscreen, that's a big thing in Australia because we've got the highest rate of melanoma in the world and um, it kills a big number of people every year. Sunscreens can be more effective uh, with nano particles in them. Spread enhanced textiles, water repellent, self cleaning, and so on. Some of these things aren't all that important, some of them uh, presumably are. Materials um, can be 50 to 100 times stronger, much lighter, which is good for aeroplanes and cars because they can be more fuel efficient. Um, nanotech is already being used to reinforce um, rubber tyres on um, or anything that needs rubber tyres. Uh, I'll skip that one. Anyway, the reason I just put those up is so that you get some very basic overview of the areas that nanotech to some extent is being used in already, um, but more likely uh, is where it's going to be used and there's research going on at the moment. Now that's just all background. Now the interesting thing is how do we approach the ethics of nanotechnology. Now suppose we compare it with information technology ethics or computer ethics, uh, the sort of thing that Sorath was talking about before where he's been looking at uh, Facebook and various other social media and seeing what to, to make of it. So what happens generally I did a lot of work in information technology too before I actually got into the nano stuff. A lot of the work in this area, 
a lot of the focus is on problems that have been caused already. Okay, we have problems to do with privacy, uh, as was mentioned by Sarah in the, in the earlier talk too. That's a problem that's here now, it's not a problem in the future. Um, and there are all sorts of these sorts of problems uh, in information technology ethics, things to do with intellectual property, for example, as well. What you do about um, pornography on the web, should the web be censored and so on. These are all problems that are around now and ethicists look at them, uh, try to work out uh, what to do. Now, nanotech is a bit different, or nanoethics is a bit different because it's new technology and there aren't many problems around yet because there aren't many products around yet. So it's more a matter of trying to predict what the problems are going to be. And then either putting um, regulations in place before the technology comes about, or perhaps even trying to influence the technologies that are going to be developed. Now, in applied ethics, a lot of applied ethics is divided between reactive, that's not pejorative, it's just descriptive, um, reactive and proactive ethics. Reactive ethics is, is just reacting to problems as they arise, like privacy um, on the internet, um, or problems to do with uh, said intellectual property or censorship or something. The problems are there, we react to them. New technologies create new situations for which we haven't got any politics. Um, that was James Moore, a philosopher at Dartmouth in the US, talked about policy vacuums. He talked, I think he wrote that first in a paper in 1986, which is a long time ago now, when computer technology was still relatively new with respect to um, the public in general. So that sort of ethics is pretty standard in in IT ethics and in a lot of other areas too. Proactive ethics in some ways is a bit more difficult and a bit more, uh, well a bit vaguer perhaps because we have to anticipate problems, we have to make predictions and those things, uh, particularly making predictions is a bit dodgy as we know because it's easy to be wrong, particularly with an enabling technology like nanotech because nanotech can be used in so many different areas, it's very difficult to predict what the outcomes are going to be, what kinds of problems it might be causing down the track. Well, it's not only problems, of course, we have to also predict benefits. I mean, this research wouldn't be going on if people didn't think there were benefits. So then it's a matter too of trying to uh, weigh up the predicted benefits against the predicted risks. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of work going on in that area. In um, Germany, they've got a few centres focused on technology, sorry, technology assessment that are looking at technology, not only technologies that are around, but technologies that are being developed or might be developed, and trying to assess those developed various scenarios, possible scenarios, and then um, make predictions <coughs> on the basis of that. Now, some predicting is pretty easy. Um, we know that already there are problems, privacy problems to do with current computer technology. If computers get smaller and faster, um, sensing devices get strong, get more powerful, we can be pretty sure that privacy problems are going to get worse. And that's um, not very difficult. But other, other problems or 
predictions are much more difficult to make. Now, I divided um, applied ethics before into reactive and proactive. Uh, it doesn't have to be just those two. Ethics can be conducted concurrently with the development of various technologies. And in a sense, that's what they're doing with centers that work on uh, technology assessment. To be effective in warding off disastrous consequences, our understanding of our man-made machines should in general develop in step with the performance of the machine. Now this was um, Norbert Wiener in 1960, sort of the father of cybernetics, and he was worried right from early in the piece uh, with computers, particularly computers that could be in some sense autonomous, that have feedback loops, um, what the effects might be, and he thought we shouldn't wait till they are already developed and then worry about what's happening. We should look at the ethics um, while the machines are being developed. So if we take that line, then we have proactive ethics on the one hand where we try and predict concurrent where we are looking at what's happening now to see the directions in which it's going, the developments are going, and reactive, looking at developments that are already happening and seeing what, what we can do about them. Okay, risks and benefits. I'll say a bit more about risks later. I know we interpret risks in too narrow a way here, um, in a way that um, it's often done in the science and so on. Um, we have to try, as I said before, to predict risks and benefits. We have to try and develop strategies for limiting the risks and maximising the benefits. I forgot what time we started there, so what time we can just continue when we get hungry. It's a risk. That's only me standing between you and eating. So we have to continue another hour at least. Oh, no. There's a limit. It's run the gun. Okay, we have to try and predict risks and benefits, but not just sitting in our armchairs saying, look, you know, I think this is a bit of a worry, what should we do about it? Things can start that way, but it should, really should be working with, or at least um, looking closely at what scientists and uh, technologists are doing uh, when we try and predict the risks and the benefits and then develop strategies for limiting risks and um, Benefits. And as I said, sometimes this will be put in uh, regulations in place so that um, there aren't too many risks, like putting speed limits on how fast cars can go, and that they're only allowed to drive on one side of the road and this sort of thing. Um, and then also for maximising the benefits. Now, what are the areas of ethical concerns? Now, I'm not going to um, say a lot about how these ethical concerns should be managed at this stage. I'll talk a bit more tomorrow about some of the more general ethical uh, issues underlying these, but I want to look now at what the some of the main areas that have been of concern, concern in the nano area. The main one has probably been health risks. Now uh, the main reasons, I'll say more about this in a minute too, but the main reason that there are health risks is that nanoparticles are very, very little. And 
it's not clear what effect they'll have on humans. Now that needs to be clarified too. Um, there are nanoparticles all around us already, so they are nothing new. We've evolved to um, cope with those. We're talking here about manufactured nanoparticles, which can be different shapes um, and so on. And the nanoparticles which seem to be the biggest problem are longish thin ones, um, which some people think could, could cause the same sorts of problems as were caused by asbestos in lots of countries, including in Australia, um, because these long, thin particles can get into the lungs and so on. Um, so there are the health risks. Distributive justice, I think um, Darrell sort of touched on this earlier on when he talked about technology often broadening the gap between haves and haves not, have not rich and poor and so on. Uh, and that's certainly been something that people in, um, some people in nanotech have been worried about. Not that all nanotech development is happening in, in um, highly developed countries. A lot of it is happening in uh, other countries as well. But there's also the issue of what products are being developed, are the products being developed, the ones that um, only rich people need, or what can say a bit more about that. So privacy and autonomy. Well, I've already said a bit about privacy. Autonomy, for well, one reason people want privacy is they think that the less privacy they have, Sorry, the more privacy they have, the less autonomy they'll have. The more people know about you, the more, um, or the less, sorry, you can do what you want to do. I'll say a bit more about all this in a minute. Military uses, human enhancement, which is a big topic in various places at the moment, and I'll say a bit more about all of these. Uh, what the, um, ethical issues are. Okay, health. Many good effects, but there are some worries. Concerns about nanoparticles in food, sunscreens, cosmetics, the environment. <coughs> the problem with, well, nanoparticles in food is that Nobody really knows yet, or at least research is still in a fairly early stage of what happens to these nanoparticles when they get inside of you. Um, do they do any damage? Can they cross over into the brain um, and do all sorts of things um, which we don't understand, which could be quite nasty? Sunscreens and Cosmetics, the sunscreen is one, and as I mentioned, it's been very topical in Australia for the problems we have. We have all these problems with the sun, which really isn't our problem, isn't, isn't our fault, because the ozone layer was ruined by the northern hemisphere, not by us. But for some reason, this big hole in the ozone layer came over us, and probably New Zealand. So we're the ones getting all of our known. But anyway, that's another matter. Um, sunscreens can be more effective, although some of it is not all that important. Um, some people don't like going outside in the summer with their noses covered in all this white stuff and their cheeks and so on. Um, but that's really not a very important issue if it's going to save you getting getting or getting skin cancer. Um, nano Sorry, um, sunscreens <coughs> containing nanoparticles can be clear. So if you're vain, you can still look as lovely as always. Nobody will know that you're covered in, in sunscreen. Not a particularly important thing, it seems to me, if there's a risk that these particles can get into the skin, into your bloodstream, into all sorts of nasty things. Cosmetics, well, it's the same. Um, I remember talking to a 
and then I saw it just a few years ago, uh, who said that he'd never let his wife use any cosmetic if he had any evidence that there were any nanoparticles in it, because he just didn't know what the effect of it could be. The environment, um, again, the effect the effects are unknown. What do these nanoparticles do? I'll well, say this more about that in a minute too. Um, what will they do to plants? What will they do to the um, things that eat the plants? And the like that. Now, there's some evidence that these nanoparticles can cause harm, but there's more research needed. Now, the thing that I want to emphasize here is that my argument isn't that this stuff's all bad. The argument is that um, not enough is known yet. A lot more research needs to be done in potential harm. So it's not so much that we need to say we shouldn't do things because they're causing harm now. It's more a matter of saying what should we do so that um, if they do cause harm, or if they can cause harm, we know about it um, and we can stop it happening in the future. Some people would argue that because of these potential problems, we should invoke the precautionary principle. Um, and I think that has some value. A lot of people are dead against the precautionary principle, but I won't say more about that now. But the point is, this is an uncertain area. Uh, we don't want to stop all the benefits. Um, because there are undoubtedly health benefits, uh, but on the other hand, we don't want to um, cause harm. Another thing that needs to be considered in all of these areas is if we're comparing risks and benefits. You know, who has the risks, who gets the benefits? I mean, it could be that with certain sorts of these health benefits, you know, I get, or well, people like me who live in the West get uh, all the health benefits because that's what the products are developed for. But poor workers somewhere are going to be the ones taking all the risks because they're developing the stuff. They don't get the benefits, but they're going to be the ones who have all the health problems in the manufacturing. Um, I'm willing to take bigger risks with things if I'm also going to get the benefits. I'm not too keen on taking big risks if all the benefits go to somebody else. So it's not only a matter of looking at risks and benefits, it's also looking at who gets the risks, who gets the benefits, and reasonable distribution of the risks and benefits. Now none of this is particularly new or world shattering, but it's something I think that if we just look at risks and benefits, we can easily overlook. Distributive justice, I've said a bit about, it's a worry that nanotech uh, could increase the disparity between the developed and developing worlds, often talked about in terms of a nano divide. Technologies are developed for the well off and produced in developed countries. Um, now, this latter isn't completely true. I mean, presumably there's not a lot of development going on in the poorest countries, but there's certainly a lot going on in countries that are not Europe or North America or Australia. Um, yeah, there's a, a comparison here, I think, or we can see why people are worried about this. Uh, sorry technologies for the well-off if we look at the, uh, the case of medical research. Now, I don't know what the current figures are. Daryl might well know more than me, but they used to talk about the 90-10 um, rule, where 90% of the health research money in the world was being spent on diseases of 10% of the world's population. Now, whether it's still that, I don't know, but that was sort of a rule of thumb. 
I don't know whether that's the case in nanotech, where 90% of the research is, to de is developing things that are only going to benefit 10% of the population. But that's something that um, needs to be thought to get out and quite easily um, make the nano divide worse. Um, now, clearly, there are benefits, or could be benefits, um, to developing countries. Efficient water purifiers, for example, cheap energy, a lot of work's going on now to develop better, uh, more efficient solar energy, uh, which obviously, once you've got this, a lot cheaper than um, fossil fuels in particular. Efficient water purifiers uh, is, is important. The water, it's a particularly clean water, is becoming a uh, scarcer resource in lots of places. Some people argue that um, while these things could help the develop, developing world, it's not clear that they will because there are a lot of technologies around the ready um, that are not being used. So why should we think it will be any different with nanotech? But anyway, um, the potential is there, so hopefully something can be done. But it's definitely an ethical issue. Smaller, faster computers, more sensitive sensing. Sensing devices will make surveillance easier. Um, combined with um, GPS, geographic positioning systems, it's very easy now for people to know exactly where you are, your employer, the police, the government. Now this has upsides too. Um, if you watch um, cop shows on telly, they're very different now from what they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Now they keep looking at um, cameras, surveillance cameras, they keep looking at them, they keep checking people's mobile phones, all this sort of thing, rather than uh, sort of wandering around the countryside talking to people trying to find out where everybody was. So the privacy thing, I think, is uh, a big thing. But and I think it's more important than, than most people these days actually uh, think we tend to look at this surveillance and say, okay, it'll make us safer, hopefully it will. Uh, it only makes us safer, of course, if we've got moderately benevolent governments. Um, if we have nasty governments, we don't really want them to know where we are and every minute of the day and exactly what we're doing. So these things um, we do need to think about to carefully. There's, they give these systems give much more power to governments, large corporations and so on, and less to individuals, which ties the privacy to the autonomy. Now there are, of course, a lot of places where we think surveillance is a good thing. I'm not too worried about surveillance at airports because um, I quite like to think that there are not too many bombs on board. So I'm willing to put up with the extra hassle of going through security. But I mean that's another case where we can see the downside but we can also see the um, positive side, some other areas of surveillance possibly that's, that's clear. Military uses, autonomous weapons. We're also, we've already seen a lot in the press about drones. They're not all autonomous, uh, but there are a lot of um, at least semi-autonomous weapons around the ready. Weapons that can decide on their target, which target they're going to hit, um, rather than relying on Person. Weapons that could target specific people and particular racial groups based on genetic codes. I don't think this is possible yet, but there is a worry that 
um, the way research is going, it could be a problem down the track. Chemical weapons, we've already had and got chemical weapons, but they could get developed in a much more sophisticated way. And it's obvious that these uh, all raise ethical issues. I mean, what do you do with autonomous weapons um, in just war theory and so on? What's reasonable force and so on? traditional just war theory and uh, the window of that to uh, look at some other or find it uh, redefine it in various ways. Human enhancement as I said before is um, it's a hot topic at the moment and not only in fringe organisations, there's a big centre at Oxford University looking at human enhancement. And Oxford's not really a fringe university. Um, so what are some of the things giving people new abilities? For example, better sight, hearing, better memories, greater strength. A lot of the research, the technical research for these sorts of developments is um, happening in, um, in the US at DARPA, which is the defence research establishment um, <coughs> trying to make soldiers better in the sense that they can kill more people before they get killed I guess is ultimately what it boils down to but not all met here enhancement is, is used in a nasty sense like that a lot of it's been developed for people who through injury or birth defects have got some um, physical problems. Uh, we've already got cochlear implants and ear implants to be developed. Better sight, there's already been things developed using nanotech uh, developments for helping people with bad eyesight or even the blind to see in some sense. More and better memories. Um, greater physical strength. There was an article in one of the papers at home the other day where this person claimed that artificial intelligence will develop to such an extent within the next years, I don't know how many, 10 or 20, that in order for humans to be able to cope, we're all going to need some sort of memory enhancement. Uh, perhaps that will happen in, in a lot of areas. Now, and longevity. Um, how long do you want to live? I mean, it's good getting rid of sickness and disease and so on, but is there a limit? I mean, already people are claiming, at home anyway, that, um, say, my grandchildren, in that generation, will have a good chance of living to 100, but that'll be the standard. When I was young, at home, the average age for a male that died was about 68. Now it's, I think, around 80. And that's happened in like, the last 40 or 50 years. Now, whether we can get dramatic increases like that over the next 40 or 50 years, I don't know. But the longevity thing, while it sounds very good, um, does create social problems. Um, from what I understand, Bismarck, the um, German Chancellor back in the 1800s, worked out how long people lived on average after they finished work, um, so how much the state could uh, afford to spend on pension for, for all the people who would retire. And that's why he picked the age of 65 as a retiring age, because most people, um, at least men, died before they were 70. Now, if governments have to keep paying these pensions for somebody at 65 and they live an average of 15 years after, that's creating problems 
um, for funding. There are less people supporting a bigger population who aren't working. Um, so then you have to think, well, should the retirement age be 65, should it be 70? And how do we do it? So there are social issues connected with that. Uh, but human enhancement, I don't, I don't want to say that it's all bad. I think a lot of it's good. Um, but there are things that we need to think about. Uh, that how it's used and how the benefits will be distributed. And okay, now this is it's actually a good slide if you can't read. Um, environment and agriculture. That one up in the top. Uh, talks about crop production products and fertilizers, things you put into a plant to make it grow better. Plant breeding and genetic modification also is an input to the plant. Um, diagnostic oh, something wrong. plant health and growth. Uh, well that's soil conditions anyway. Um, and then from the plant you get nanotarticles, particles, water goes in, soil improvement. Now, so there are a lot of issues that have come up in environment and agriculture to do with nanotech as well. And there's some evidence that nanoparticles connect the food chain through food production. Sorry, food produced on soil containing nanoparticles. So the environmental thing and the human health thing are fairly closely related. Um, if nanoparticles enter the food chain, they get into animals, they get into people. Um, and then we back with the problem of what happens to these nanoparticles when they're in us. Um, they can enter the soil through the use of biosolids, byproduct and sewage treatment processes used as fertilizers. Because um, I'm going to go around and around in circle. We eat stuff uh, containing nanoparticles or we put sunscreen on and so on. Eventually those particles come out of the body and then we use that as fertilizer gets into the soil, gets into plants, and comes back up through the food. Um, now, it may not be a problem. Some of it might be a problem. Some of it not a problem. It's an area where we need to do a lot more research. And it is really an ethical issue with res or regarding what research is carried out. Um, no government or private firm has got an infinite amount of money to do research, so research has to be prioritised. Um, so there is a big, there are a lot of ethical considerations in deciding which research is going to get funded and which research isn't going to get funded. Um, currently we tend to fund research which is most likely to make the biggest profit. Uh, but that isn't necessarily the way that things should be going. Okay, well as I said at the beginning, I'm really only um, setting the scene for what the uh, ethical problems in nanotech are or, um, yeah, sorry, what they are right or where the areas of the problems lie, not giving you any guidance as to how we go about solving them or what the solutions are. Um, okay, nanotech raises many. I think it does. Um, yeah, nanotech, um, as I think I was saying, raises a lot of um, very interesting possibilities to make our lives better, to make everybody's lives better. Um, the 
there are serious um, risks. Right. Um, so there are exciting possibilities for a better life. One of the things, and this I probably should emphasize too, is that ethicists in the area of science and technology tend to have a very bad name because the scientists and technological developers think we're against everything. Um, and sometimes it probably sounds like that because it's the role of the, an ethicist, it's actually the role of the philosopher to question everything, um, which often can be annoying to others. But in, in this area, we do have to look at what the exciting possibilities are, whether the benefits outweigh the risks, how we make that decision and so on. Um, so we, we need to be positive because it's not only the role of an ethicist to say this is bad, don't do it. It's also the role to say this is good, do it. Um, but, but nanotech does raise some serious concerns. If we've looked at health and environmental risks for one, fair distribution of benefits and risks. I think the two overarching questions really that we need to look at, and which I haven't um, today, but I'll, I'll leave that um, for you to think about and we might get back to it tomorrow. What sort of a world do we want to live in? Right now, I think, I think all ethics to do with nano, with um, <coughs> science and technology really gets back to this question of what, world, what sort of world do we want to live in? I mean, I'd be quite happy to live in a world without the internet. Has the internet made the world better? Yes. Perhaps. I'm not quite so sure. I mean, I know that I'm in a very small minority. But if you look at all of the good things, and there are a lot I use, I don't use Facebook, but I use email a lot, I use, I use Google um, to get all sorts of information that I couldn't get before. I can download books which might have taken me months to get otherwise. All of that sort of thing is good. I can talk to my kids, I can do all sorts of things. Most of these things, of course, I could have done before, except my study. Um, but it's, it's certainly very good. It's raised enormous problems to do with surveillance. It's raised enormous problems to do with, um, I'm not quite sure what the words are, but people in social media mainly mixing with themselves and not getting a broad range of views. Um, it's very easy to talk to people who agree with you. Um, it's much harder to talk to people who radically disagree with you. And Unfortunately, the social media encourages people to talk to like-minded people. Um, anyway, there are a whole lot of things, and I'm just expressing my personal view here, that I, I think we need to think about whether certain things, you know, what sort of world we want to live in. Do certain things make the world better overall? Don't they? If, they, if it's dubious, what do we do to try and make it? Better. We're not going to get rid of these technologies, I know that. Um, but that's a sort of, I think, an overarching question we need to think about. The other one, which is probably related, is what sort of people do we want to be? Um, and this gets back particularly, I guess, to the human enhancement sort of thing. I mean, do I want to be an enhanced human? Do I want to live for 200 years? Um, longevity seems good, but if we're a bit worried about dying, unless we are immortal, we're going to die once, regardless of whether it's after 50 years or 500. So if you're scared of dying, you're going to be scared anyway. So the important thing is not to be scared of dying, not to extend life indefinitely. Like that. Um, so that again, I mean, what sort of people do we want to be? What sort of world do we want to be? overarching questions which I think we need to keep in the back of our minds when we are looking at um, ethics of science and technology in general and certainly nanoethics in particular. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions? Do we have a mobile mic? No. Is that what it is? Okay, good. So please use the mic.
Um, let me just, I was just uh, curious about um, a pair of sunglasses that I saw um, when I was in the plane. It's sold in the duty free shop, which can actually capture a video of what you're going to see, so you don't need to carry a camera. Is that using nanotechnology? Uh, well, it could be. I, a specific example, I don't know, but certainly uh, nanotech does enable all of these small and much more sensitive devices which we couldn't have before. I mean, it's not the only thing. Technology is getting better in a whole lot of things, but it is sort of the ultimate in, in that. Thanks. Hello, good morning. I am actually interested more on the cosmetics being used by women. So, how does nanotechnology apply to cosmetics? <laughs> oh, the technical details, I don't know. Um, what I do know from talking to people um, in the scientific world and from reading is that a lot of nano, well, a lot of cosmetics have had nanoparticles in them, and there has been a lot of there have been a lot of criticism, particularly by people like Friends of the Earth. Now, I presume that the nanoparticles um, enhance the cosmetics in certain ways. I don't know; they might cover up skin blemishes in a in a less um, obvious way, all of this sort of thing. Perhaps they last longer on your face. Something um, probably in similar ways that um, uh, they work in sunscreens that are less obvious, they last longer, they're more effective, and so on. Yeah, um, but it has been a, a big area of, of concern. Professor, I have one specific question around risk versus benefits comparison. So in the risk versus benefit comparison, there is not much data, not much data available. So because of that, I just have one specific question around risk versus benefit comparison. So, so far the data is not enough available, research data. So is there any clear cut example is one thing? that uh, what are the, you know, market available things already based on the nanotechnology has got a higher, higher wages of risk than the benefit. Then the question is the market ethics around the product. If the product is, they are already in the market, then what is the ethical aspect into the product? This is causing harm to the people. And my, another is the pricing issue because you know, nanotechnology has got so much of good things to do with the world, of course. The people have got a lot of acceptance. But when it is a kind of a water purifier, I think the developing country need it most. But the pricing of the water purifier is so high. So what is the thought around these kind of things, like to make the nanotechnology more available to the poorer people, benefiting the developing country? And I have another point to share. That's the distributive justice, as I, as you mentioned earlier, this is a longevity. Okay, fine. You know, because of the public health advantage, like 18th century, then onward, public health started because of health science, public health, humanity safeguarded. We have 30 years plus bonus of life expectancy across the world. But another question is the quality of life. You know, if I live longer and then I have so many problems after certain years. My disability at just a life year and the quality of this life year index is the question. So, how this neurotechnology is thinking on this kind of longer longevity issue around quality of life? Mm -hmm. Right, um, well, I'll start with the last one first, and I might have to get you to remind me about the earlier ones. Oh, I think on the longevity thing, um, I think you're, you're clearly right quality of life is, is more important than, than length of life. And I think that's one of the things, I mean, that's, that's much harder to quantify. You can easily say, well, so-and-so lived to 60, you know, somebody else lived to 80. It's much harder to say, well, this person had a life 
you know, seven out of ten, this person had a life, eight out of ten, and then you don't know, do you? So, and we tend to do things that are easier to quantify, I think. And the longevity, too, I would imagine that most of developments in all health, not only now, but for nanomedicine, has to do with um, keeping people healthy. And longevity is sort of a byproduct of keeping people healthy for longer, I guess, um, and eradicating certain diseases. I mean, there are certain diseases that um, I'm trying to think. When I was young, it was very common for men to drop dead in their 50s. Right? Um, partly because they smoked an awful lot. Um, partly probably because of their diet. Uh, partly because there weren't such good ways of finding out you know, whether you've got a bad heart or not. Um, but now, as I said before, at least in Australia, it's, it's around 80. And for women, it's always a little bit longer. Um, and I think, to some extent, this is tied up too with at least one of your earlier points about um, you know, the role of the market and so on. Now, clearly, a lot of products are developed because there's profit in developing them and there's no profit in developing other things or very little. Um, most of the profit is made by developing goods for the developed part of the world because that's where most of the money is. Uh, and I guess that will always be the case regardless of which parts are developed. Now, that's a... I mean, I think what that shows fairly clearly is that if we're at all worried about ethical issues about moral issues and about fairness. Profit presumably will always be one consideration, but it certainly shouldn't be the only one and it probably shouldn't very often be the overriding one um, because otherwise a whole lot of people don't get any benefits out of what's happening and the world becomes um, even less fair. But I, I mean, I think if we keep in mind with all of these things the question of what sort of world do we want to live in, um, I think we can sort of see that, I mean, a fair world is going to be better in all sorts of ways. I mean, it doesn't, in my personal life, whether somebody in some other part of the world is rich or poor doesn't have a big impact on me, except perhaps that I get a bad conscience. But if the whole world is more or less um, living well or moderately well, there's going to be a lot less chance, I think. Now, this could be disputed. Um, there won't be uprisings of the poor against the rich and so on, because at least that's what one would like to think. Um, I know that there are a whole lot of other reasons people fight, but certainly disparity between rich and poor is, is one. Yeah. Sorry, I've forgotten your first. No, 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 no problem is Andy already there. You know that uh, so far the nanotechnology example that you have given is more kind of pro-rich, pro-rich man in favor of the rich people, not in favor of the poor people I found majority. Now the question is when there is an attractive product in the market, fine people are very passionate to pick up those. But when the market where is the market ethics into this like because you know it should be regulation based, specified so that the, because there is not much research yet done about the harm and the risk of the nanotechnology, many of the items. So, but it is there in the market. It's spread it already. So now the question is, who is going to regulate all this like product-based ethics and product kind of regulations? Who is going to what, sorry? The spread of the market product yeah. of nanotechnology, we are getting advantage, we are used to it. But there is not much research yet done to confirm the harm, the effects of that product. But the product is already in the market. Now the question is, who is going to regulate this bigger market? This is a very important right. issue. Yeah, look, the, um, there's been a lot of discussion about regulation in the nanotech area. Uh, 
for probably for 12 or 15 years. And there are two, there have been two sides to this argument. One is, well, all of the products uh, developed by nanotech or all of the um, materials have been around for a long time. So the regular, we've already got regulations for all sorts of chemicals and so on. So those regulations are enough. So that's one side of the coin. That's usually pushed by people who want to claim that nanotech isn't really very different from anything else. The other side is that people will argue, look, nano products, nano particles have got a lot of different properties. A lot of the harmful effects won't be captured by the regulations we've got already. So we actually need new regulations. So this has been a hot topic for a long time. Um, and certainly it has to be a government level. I mean, there's no point in leaving this to market forces or anything else. Just more of the government. Mm -hmm. On here. Thank you, Sir, in relation to the current discussion on who's availing more of the technology, um, I would like to ask, can you cite countries where these industries of nanotechnology are being made? Are it, are the industries that utilize nanotechnologies um, in developing countries or in uh, first world countries? Uh, the, the majority, I, mean, if you, I think, I just said I didn't believe in the internet. If you did a search online, I think you'd find out that the, probably the bulk of the developments at this stage are happening in the US, uh, with some in other developed parts of the world like um, uh, sorry, Europe. Uh, there's a little bit in Australia, but I mean, we've only got 20 odd million people, so we haven't compete with the rest of the world. There's a lot happening, particularly in the scientific area, in both China and India. Whether there are a lot of prob um, pro so products coming out of those countries yet, I'm not sure, but certainly um, there's a lot. There's a lot happening in, in China. India, of course, for a long time has been one of the world leaders in um, information technology. Um, so it would be very surprising if there weren't a lot of developments in that area in that area. But sir, where do they get the materials that they use for these types of technologies? The materials, the uh, human uh, resource? The basic materials, I don't think, are very hard to come by. It's just a matter of then producing the nanoparticles or the nanomaterials from the more basic materials here. Yeah. That's why a lot of people think it could be down the track um, very cheap because you don't need a lot of material to make in very little things. Since nanotechnology is pretty much the embodiment of the Pandora's box paradox, I mean, it's, it's something that once released, you can't feasibly put back in. I, I, I know you said you didn't want to talk about it, but I have to ask, what could possibly be the arguments against the precautionary principles <laughs> in, in the case of this? Uh, well, the precautionary principle just in outline is that if there's um, good reason, well, if there are reasons, even if scientifically they are not that reasons, that something is dangerous, you don't actually do a couple until you know that it's safe. Right? That's sort of the basic thing. You don't need to wait till there's conclusive scientific evidence that something is dangerous. You try and take precaution before that. <coughs> now, the, the main argument against it is that that will stifle development because there's always uncertainty. We can never be sure that something is um, going to be risk-free and so on. Um, and I remember once uh, giving a talk, it was actually a the defender of the precautionary principle. I was giving a uh, talk on the precautionary principle and defending it at a conference in the US and um, 
the what the main rejoinder that I remember is that well, you know that's just a waste of time because litigation will sort out all the problems. You know, if you do something it's harmful, then you'll bring in the lawyers um, and litigation will start and that that in itself will stop people doing things that are harmful. Now that strikes me as being a bit of a worry because you may well be be dead before yeah, it's you bring in the lawyers. First. But there's a vast literature on this on both sides. So is, uh, if we look at traditional medicines, uh, is there knowledge of any active ingredients which are really nanoparticles? Do you know uh, I don't know if there's any great knowledge of that. One of the interesting things though, uh, was interesting from my perspective, is that there is I did some work at one of the um, nano research institutes in Adelaide for a little while, and that's on material science. And one of the people who was working there in the nano area, he was doing work on um, sort of hip replacements. You know, what goes on between your hip and whatever it is that's in. And if you have a hip replacement, obviously there's friction. So. But if you don't have hip replacement, there's still friction. Um, but yeah, and one of the things he was working on was looking at um, uh, the indigenous knowledge or the knowledge of indigenous people in Australia. Some of the plants in the desert areas, uh, or very arid areas anyway, where they um, they had used as various for various sorts of treatment. He found that. Some of those plants actually contain materials that um, seem to be very useful in um, creating a layer between the replaced hip and, and the bone. Now this was a chap working in nanotech. Now whether there were uh, any na um, known nanomaterials in those plants that he was working on, I don't know, but there's certainly at least one person in the world who's been looking at that. Well, Selva and I again wrote the material on nanotechnology for teaching some years ago. Yeah. We've used in the uh, cross cultural introduction uh, of biotech, so do you have any comments? Nanotechnology now is catching up, especially on material science. Uh, we are even our students are developing material for energy conversion and energy transmission using uh, different types of uh, metals. And uh, regarding the traditional medicine, traditional medicine as such is a crude actually. They are doing it crude method only, still now. But now this is a time for us to think about going for uh, switching over to nanotechnology. Not only the pure material, but combination. So probably that may fetch uh, new, or uh, that may lead to new uh, thinking on the nanomedicine, especially on traditional medicines, band products mostly. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I'll uh, must talk about that with you more because this. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this friend of mine in Adelaide um, has done sort of any work on whether the products he was looking at or what the relationship between nano and those products were, but I know that he's certainly interested in both. And if there is, has been work done there, I'd be certainly interested in finding out more about it. Uh, that has been read through in our Skype classes about nanotechnology. So there was a lot of the kind of you know, research critiques on this and a uh, lot of points in favor. And I remember a lot of case stories have been done across the world. And ultimate conclusion point, if I remember, because I, I try to take notes of the important points, 
So if I remember that the total conclusive points till now, whatever the technology around research have been done so far, not much indicative harm has been, you know, like established, confirmed. And because of that, uh, people are more in favor of still now more in nanotechnology. Not very indicative harm we found. We went to quite a number of case to learn number. And the conclusive point was, I even asked you the question, you know, what the conclusive point you should take inside. So I remember most of the case story ended up like this, okay, so far not much indicative harms have been identified. That's good about this, but by taking instance of an example, just opposite to this. Okay, we are using the sunscreen thing and it's pretty common everywhere in the world. So, okay, people are used to this. Now, if after 50 years, 40 years, then it has been, you know, discovered that it has caused some kind of micro level damage to the body, then what is that? What is the kind of ethical duty to it? Yeah, well, look, if something only causes yeah. minor damage after 40 or 50 years um, and the benefits are great, then I presume benefits would outweigh the costs or the risks. On the point about um, <coughs> there not being a lot of evidence yeah. yet that uh, there are a lot of harms, I have probably got a bit behind in my reading. Certainly, <coughs> up until not all that long ago, one of the reasons for that is that there wasn't anywhere near as much research being done on potential harms. And one reason for that is that it's hard to get funding for that. People, I mean, things get funded if they're going to make money. Yes. If you find, if you're doing research on, you know, whether something's harmful, that probably won't make you a lot yes. of money. Yes. So, I mean, that's not a knockdown argument against um, the view that there aren't many harms, but it's something that needs to be taken into account. That's a question, who would find a research that would prove that nano, some nanotechnologies uh, do bad things to the body? Because uh, the industry is, like for example, cosmetics. Cosmetics is one of the largest industries in the world and uses nanotechnology. So I, I don't know if there are researches for cosmetic products that causes harm. Look, I think, as I said before, a lot of these things um, just have to be done in a government room because the market can be very good at some things, but the other things just won't work. But, you know, sometimes government is also people with a giant multinational company. Sometimes I think government is also crippled to deal with the multinational company. <laughs> Because of that, like, you know, smoking is harmful and it's 60, 70 years back knowledge, we have confirmed science, but still there's tobacco industry growing up and on the side, <coughs> even the multinational company have the tobacco industry growing up and they are investing a lot of money to their research as well, simultaneously, for the lung cancer and all this. So, you know, it, it, is, it has got so much of the market interest. So, Sometimes government, government doesn't even have the strength to deal with the market because there's so much of financial dependence of the government too. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. It's obviously um, a complicated issue um, in lots of ways. Um, smoking is probably, I mean, that's an interesting case too because a lot of people keep smoking because they're addicted to it. Right? They might know that it's causing them harm, but they just can't stop for various reasons. Um, another case that is, I think, instructive here is that, I can't remember what year it was, but I think it was in the late 1800s or very early 1900s, a report went to the British government pointing out in detail what the dangers of asbestos were. So that was and then when did we start doing something or worrying about it? Probably in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. So that report had been sitting there, um, presumably somewhere in some big building in London, 
for all this time, people knew what was or a few people knew what was in it. Um, but nothing was done about it. And you can't say, well, we had to use asbestos because people had an addiction, because they didn't. I mean, it was a cheap, or a, thought to be a good, cheap building material. Um, so, yeah, I mean, governments as well as industries can hide a lot of research that they don't like to. And of course, the market can come into play there to some extent if there's a lot of money to be made by that. Actually, I was going to say there's you can use market forces against uh, to your side, to your benefit as well. Uh, there's one case recently where there was a hedge fund set up basically to short stocks of companies that had been exploited by the very hackers uh, who figured it out. So they would basically show the company this is what's wrong. The company wouldn't respond to it, so they would say, "All right, well we're going to short your stock and then release the information." And make money. So you, you financialize the, the antithesis, basically. So, yeah, you give an economic reason uh, to do that. So, if, if you wanted to research what's wrong with nanotechnology, you then do your own prior research and then you force the company to correct itself or you force the government to correct itself or something like that. Yeah, could also invite universities for research. Yeah. Universities fund research, so if you think that uh, something is wrong and companies would not fund it, government sometimes fund it, but sometimes they don't if it's not their priority. Universities are an interesting avenue for researchers. Yes, yeah, that's, that's true. It depends. It would, be, it would vary probably between countries. Um, but in Australia, I'd certainly not the university researching with government research because the universities, researching universities by and large gets funded by the government. So not totally, some of it's funded by industry, but a lot of it's funded by the government. There are a few cases, um, if it's very expensive medical suits, then uh, pharmaceutical companies will try to assess the data in clinical trial. And uh, through their clinical trials, Sometimes they take a proportionary approach, which means that some people who might have benefited because their genotype is, uh, would have benefited from this product even though the majority of people have a different genotype and they have a side reaction. So if we do a genotyping, then we can try and separate out the groups who will benefit from those who will not benefit because most of the side reactions uh, side effects are caused by particular uh, genetic mutations that we carry. Uh, so through the sort of genomics approach, we can develop uh, products which for 20% of people will be good, 80% of people will not be good. But then in, in that way, the 20% of people can benefit. Uh, and so you find some clinical trials where they're very cautious once they see a side effect, they will not pursue development of that drug. Uh, and so if we revisit now those old drugs that failed, we may find genetically which groups would benefit, which would not. And if we are then link it to the use. So that's using a commercial mechanism. Um, and because, so when there are large, you know, obvious side effects, companies will not bring something to the market because they know they're going to be liable, especially in countries where they reliability suits uh, multi-million dollar uh, events. Mm -hmm. um, with nanotechnology, when the, you know, the, the implications at the moment seem like very small financially, though there's this unknown issue of environmental damage and health damage. And I think uh, some blocks which are going to need for using at working in a peace park uh, all contain nanotechnology products and they have done for some time. Um, so you'll be using it probably every day. Uh, whether or not it has some long term effect, um, we don't, maybe we don't know. And if it's quite small, as John said, it's going to be hard to detect because people are going to suffer from uh, other causes of 
harm to their life rather than some side effect of a little uh, cosmetics. Um, well, will there be an easier solution really, like in that case also to you, like uh, if we make much more awareness, accessibility of information to the people, consumer, so the around the product, whatever, particularly the products which are related to cosmetics and food, so I'm, I'm telling specifically. So if there is more information to the people level, accessibility of information, then the people as a consumer are more conscious consumer. So they can really regulate the market. So if the informations are more allowable, accessible to the consumer group, then the consumer can regulate other than doing research or because you know that is a lot more economic and a lot more political issue to it. So giving the market regulation to the consumer and people side can be one of the solution. But now the question is well, how much of the awareness? Because consumer are different kind of social categorical layer. So if I make information how much they can take it, how much they can absorb it. How they can understand it, that is also a question as well. Yeah, look, I think that's true. The more information we've got, um, potentially the better choices we can make or, or will make. Um, there are a whole lot of factors sort of feeding into that. One is, I mean, how much do we worry when we're in a hurry? Like, we, we just don't bother reading things that's like, you know, you want to download something from the internet, it says click here um, if you agree with our privacy policy or something. How many of us read it? We usually can't be bothered, we just hope. Um, and I think it's like that with a lot of other products too, if, if there are time constraints. Um, I mean, that's, well, I'm saying in this case, that's me being lazy, right? I presume that I'm in a majority. Uh, then there's also the case that um, sometimes we don't have an enormous choice with products. If you take, say, um, well, the case I'm most familiar with is Australia and the supermarkets. When it comes to food, there's only two big supermarkets that control, I don't know, what, 90% of, of all food. Um, and they, um, okay, prices are probably cheaper, perhaps a little bit, but you don't have the range that you used to have because they sell all of the big, or stop making the big selling items. Um, so there are a whole lot of factors that feed into how much choice we actually have, as well as our own, or in my case, my own laziness of not getting around to reading. 